Thank you, Hannah. Um, it, I, I will just say hello to Josephine uh, in Alston. Um, we haven't, I don't think we've met for a long time. It's nice to see, see you there. And uh, a very warm welcome to everyone. Um, my name is Jeff Cowton. I'm the principal curator and the head of learning at Wordsworth Grasmere. And uh, it's my pleasure to, to start this off this evening to, to, to talk with Harriet for the first half and then to hand over to, to Harriet for, for the second half. But um, I just, if it's all right with, with you, I'd like to just begin with just a little sad news. Um, for anyone who has joined us for the, the last uh, webinar that we did a couple of weeks ago on Susanna Blairmeyer, uh, we dedicated that event uh, to Dr. Christopher Maycock, who was a descendant of the Cumbrian writer, to the Susanna Blairmeyer. And he was able to join us at the end of the webinar. He was very poorly, but he was able to join us for the last couple of minutes. Um, and for anyone who was at that webinar or happens to know Dr. Maycock, um, if you haven't heard, it's, it's just very sad to report that since that webinar, he, he's passed away. And so we would just like to, to, just to recognize that and to say how pleased we were that he was able to join us for that evening. But uh, as as for as to tonight, um, this is a an event that's going to be really in two halves. As I say, Harriet and I will will start us off. Uh, welcome, Harriet. Nice to see you. Um, and then Harriet will lead the second half, where we'll go into more detail about the the project uh, and about the exhibition. Um, so. It's a project that um, really, I think as far as we're, we see it, successfully links the past and the present. Um, writers from the past with very real issues today and in the past, of course, uh, it links academia with museum collections, PhD research with people with the lived experience of, of disability and with the responses, if you like bringing it together, interpreted by an artist, Rachel Sparks, who we'll meet soon, into what I think is a visually stunning exhibition in the gallery. Uh, it's in the Wordsworth Museum, and uh, I can't not tell you that this evening um, we're, we're, we are in for a, a museum's and heritage. Well, I, I know I'm being too presumptuous, um, too optimistic, but we're shortlisted for a museum's and heritage award, which I think the results are being announced tonight. So who knows? But it, it's in a, it's in the Wordsworth Museum, and it's a very fine, handsome display, and it's had some very good responses. Uh, we'll we'll say a few, talk a bit, a little bit about that, very shortly. But the the kind of responses that have come from participants, from project leaders, from visitors to the exhibition really have had an impact. And that's a word, of course, that we use uh, really to measure whether what we do is worthwhile. So there's been meaningful conversations um, amongst ourselves with the workshop participants, with our visitors, a raised awareness. And as I say, an exhibition seen by several thousand people uh, over um, a couple of month period. So Harriet, uh, welcome. Hello. Uh, and quite a project. Uh, it's been a big part of your life up at sort of a, we seem to have many conversations in, in the last few weeks and months. How, how have you found it? What's your overall feeling about it now? It's been a journey. Um, I feel like that's the most appropriate way of describing it. Um, I've learned so much from you and the team in terms of heritage work, but also I've learned so much from the participants as well. So I've really grown from both sides, both on the personal level and um, an academic and museums level as well. Well, I know it's, it's had an impact on how you, you might be seeing your sort of careers, hasn't it, in a kind of way from academic and museums. And yeah, definitely. That's an interesting outcome. Um, Harriet's a, a PhD student uh, on a coll collaborative doctoral award between Oxford University and the Wordsworth Trust here at Wordsworth Grasmere. And uh, we thought, didn't we, that a good place to start was in the past. So. It's a project that's founded on the writings and lives of people 200 years ago, informing, if you like, conversations about today. But a good place to start would be with the four women writers that have been at the center of the project. So would you would you like to talk us through um, yes. aspects of their lives and writing? Yes, so um, if we start with Dorothy Wordsworth, how could we not at a Wordsworth Trust event? Yeah, so Jeff's going to show you some um, exciting manuscripts, but just while he's getting that up, 
Um, I feel like Dorothy Wordsworth really needs no introduction and certainly um, the regulars to the webinar will know a lot about her, but she was born in 1771 and died in 1855. Um, and sometimes she was overlooked, maybe some would say, in favor of her brother, William. Um, but Dorothy too was a writer and a poet. So what you can see here is actually a letter, um, which I will go into a bit more detail about. Um, but her journals are perhaps one of her most famous um, things that she's written. And they can tell us a considerable amount about how she was troubled by both her mental and her physical health. Um, in her later life, um, well, in her early life, she was very active, but in her later life, um, her health deteriorated quite rapidly um, and she was frequently confined to her bed. Um, so what we can see here is an extract from a letter to her friend, Hannah Hoare. So I think this letter is really emotive. And if you can read her handwriting, um, you will see this, but I'll just read you a couple of lines from this. So um, we looked at this poem in um, the, the workshop, but she says, five years of sickness and of pain, this weary frame has traveled o'er, but God is good. And once again, I rest upon a tranquil shore. So um, this is really a sense of acceptance and she seems to be at peace with her condition. But what I should tell you is that um, in this letter um, to her friend, she couldn't bring herself to describe her present sense her present state of ill health. So instead she includes a poem. So she really includes this creative response instead of talking about um, the physical symptoms and you know the practicalities of her condition. And I think this is really powerful. Um, so I hope you can I hope you can see that. There's that there's that final stanza, isn't there? They tell me I'm one faithful. Oh faithful yes. Night, when thou my faithful friend didst Part from me in holy trust that soon my earthly cares must end. It's beautiful, really. Mm. Um, so another writer that we looked at in the workshop um, was Francis Burney. So um, just while Jeff is getting um, the manuscript, um, she was born in 1752 and died in 1840. Um, and she was a prolific novelist. Um, early in her life, she was a keeper of the robes to Queen Charlotte, wife of George III. Um, her first novel, Evelina, which is what you can see here, um, was originally published anonymously and she went on to write three more novels. Um, so the text we looked at in the workshop was actually a letter. Um, so, I'll give you a bit of context behind that. So the author um, moved to France. So her husband, um, General Alexandre Doble, um, could take up a position in uh, the government of Napoleon Bonaparte in 1801. And while she was there, she began to feel a heaviness in her breast, um, which was actually breast cancer. And we would refer to this as a disabling condition. Um, but her husband was able to use her, his connections to obtain the services of the best French doctors to treat her. Um, so the actual full text of um, her letter is on the British Library website, but um, after experiencing debilitating pain and limited use of her arm for several years, um, Bernie undertook the brave decision to undergo a mastectomy without effective anaesthetic. I believe she says that um, she had nothing but a wine cordial. Um, and like Dorothy's poem, it took her nine months uh, before she could um, bring herself to write about the operation. So um, we talked about in the workshop was um, how creativity can really help you to express complicated feelings. Um, and Bernie writes, to conclude, the evil was so profound, the case so delicate, the precautions necessary for preventing a return so numerous that the operation, including the treatment and the dressing, lasted 20 minutes. Um, it's really an unbelievable letter and it really conveys um, the relationship between trauma and writing and it's it's really quite powerful so if you want to read more about that um you can definitely find that online um and then um Susanna Blameyer who some of you might know from the webinar um a couple of weeks ago 
Um, so she was born in 1747 um, and she died in 1794. She's a relatively unknown writer, but I do believe um, the Wordsworth Trust holds, I think, all of her manuscripts. Just about, yeah. Yeah, um, she has really beautiful writing, uh, as you can see from this. Um, but she was often referred to as the Muse of Cumberland, um, and she wrote in both the Scottish and Cumberland dialects, as well as standard English. Um, although several of her songs were published in newspapers and periodicals, much of her work remained unpublished throughout her life. Um, elements of her poetry and prose reflect her debilitating um, experience of chronic illness. And what you can see here, her poem, A Call to Hope, um, it really details her plea to the goddess of health, Hygieia. Um, Susanna, like many of the women um, here, suffered profoundly with symptoms that meant she often, often struggled to walk unaided. Um, I think it's it's very um, beautiful when she writes, I don't know if you can get to this part near the end where she says, um, from present ill, let fancy bear these painful sufferings into air. These catch the spirits light and free that leave me blessed with them and thee. Um, again, the profound sense of acceptance that she ends the poem on here, it, it really resonates, I think. Um, mm -hmm. like, like so many of these women's um, writing it's it's so beautiful there's and a, then there's another there's just another poignant piece on this manuscript all right uh which is just i don't know whether people can read that but it says wrote after a long illness and not expecting to be speedily recovered yeah below that someone's written died 1794 well that's isn't it just two years after the the, the day of that manuscript. Yeah. Thank you for showing that to us. And then finally, um, we will look at a writer who is very close to my heart and the subject of my thesis, um, Mary Robinson. Um, so she was born in 1757 and died in 1800. Um, and I think you can see here um, her memoirs. Um, so when Mary Robinson took to the stage at age just 14, nobody could have really predicted her swift rise to fame, nor the equally rapid decline of her health. Um, she published novels, poems and essays prolifically until her death, aged 43, and she was admired by Samuel Taylor Coleridge and William Godwin, among others. Um, and then there's a very poignant um, part of her memoirs, um, which... Um, so the second half of her memoirs um, was completed by her daughter as she as Robinson died before it could be finished. Um, and her daughter describes um, the occasion which her mother became ill. Um, so she writes in 1784, her fate assumed a darker hue. She was attacked by a malady to which she had nearly fallen a victim. Um, and then I will skip a part, but she says, thus at four and 20 years of age, in the pride of her youth and in the bloom of beauty was this lovely, unfortunate woman reduced to a state of more than infantine helplessness. So it's thought that she contracted rheumatism. Um, so in her memoirs, which it's disputed that this is actually the case by her biographers, um, her, her, in the memoirs, it says that um, she caught a chill but it's likely that she actually contracted rheumatism after a miscarriage um, and it left her incredibly weak and she could hardly stand, um, let alone perform on the stage. So she invented herself as a feminist writer and thinker. So I think um, all of these women definitely have a place here. They are all incredible in their own right, even if I am biased. <laughs> Thanks for showing us that, Jeff. No, it's it's a pleasure. Thank you for for bringing them to life and, and to and, and the and the the women themselves. So it's it would be right to say then that the the women that you we just looked at there their their disability um, developed as as life went on. Yeah. Be. So if we were to to go back. Um, just talk a little bit about you, if that's all right. <laughs> so, so before we met, before um, we started this this project, tell tell us what what you were doing. 
So, um, well, I grew up in Liverpool, in case you couldn't tell from my accent, um, and I have always loved literature. Um, I was a massive bookworm. So I did my undergraduate degree in English literature at Royal Holloway University of London. Um, and then I studied for my master's in French literature at um, Oxford at Jesus College, where I am now. Um, and then I applied for my doctorate and here I am working on Mary Robinson. And so it's a collaborative doctoral award. Is that, is that, is that a common thing? Uh, is that different to a doctoral award? So um, a collaborative doctoral award is different um, because it's basically a competitive scholarship where you not only work on your PhD thesis, but you also work at a partner institution, which is usually a museum or gallery like uh, the Wordsworth Trust. Um, and I think it's quite unusual as a um, an academic to be given so much practical experience. Um, and yet, yeah, particularly my project, as I have friends who do collaborative doctoral awards and they write blog posts, they do outreach. But, um, you know, the fact that you put so much trust in me and allowed me to do an exhibition, it's it's really an amazing opportunity. And, you know, I couldn't have done this without the Wordsworth Trust support. Well, well, likewise, we, 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 would, we would be missing this exhibition without you, what you brought to it. So the subject of your, of your main work, as it were, and the subject for this, this element of it, how did, how did that come about? So um, the topic of my collaborative doctoral award is, um, it's called Relating Romantic Disabilities. So um, that was my starting point for both my thesis and my work with you. Um, so when I was looking at what to focus my thesis on, I came upon Mary Robinson. Um, and in my background reading, I discovered that there are so many understudied women writers um, with disabilities that we just don't know about or we don't really talk about. Um, we might talk about other things, um, but others like Blame Eye, we just don't talk about. So, um, you know, when I was talking with you about the things that we could get involved in together, um, when you mentioned that I could do this exhibition, it seemed like a great opportunity to showcase these writers. Well, being, being heard uh, is a theme that's come up, hasn't it, through, through people say in the workshops. I think yeah. there was a comment where someone said that they felt they'd been heard and a chance to talk about their lives. And that also has come up in the feedback to the exhibition, that it's helped people visiting the exhibition to, to feel that they've been seen and, and heard. Um, the chronology of it, um, can you, for those who haven't been involved, um, what did you have to do? What, 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 yeah. what stages did you go through? So I think we've been talking about this for, I think, over a year, maybe a year and a half, I think. Um, but then I remember we met in about March 2021 to just brainstorm ideas. Um, and then I met with Rachel, I think, last summer in about July. Um, and then I applied for TORCH funding through the Oxford Research Centre in Humanities, um, who is co-funding this exhibition. Um, I applied for that funding in October. Um, and then I think it was over Christmas when I found out that I'd been successful for the funding. Um, and then you agreed to match fund it, which um, meant that the project could really get going. And I think it started in January after the uh, Christmas break. And what can I say? It's been a whirlwind getting everything done. So you had workshops? Oh, yes. Um, I should say, so after we got the funding in January, we held the workshops in March. Um, so we had two workshops, um, one with um, able-bodied participants, um, and that was a theatrical workshop, which Rachel will tell you more about. And then I ran a literary workshop with participants with disabilities. Um, and then this fed into um, Rachel's piece of art, which we will see very shortly. So shall we, shall we now see the exhibition, which is inspired by these many conversations, as well as the, the, the lives that we've just been looking at? Yes, of course. So I will share my screen. Um, so um, I hope you can see this. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this because you'll hear from Rachel about the thought process. So here's an image of the whole exhibition. So we have the artwork, which is obviously the main focus point and designed to really draw you in because that was the, the goal. Um, the community gallery is in a really interesting um, space 
where everybody passes. And um, you can see in the photo, people might be putting their things in the lockers. So we really had to capture um, people's attention. Um, so yeah, I think we have the two exhibition panels um, over on this side. Um, and then we have the artwork and then there is a lot of interpretation around it. So um, I wrote one panel which explained my thought process and then Rachel has hers. Um, and yes. Oh, also I should mention, I don't know if you can see, but if you do actually visit the exhibition, there is an iPad. I would be grateful if you could fill in my survey um, to give us some even, even more feedback. Um, so yes. On the on the tabletop there, there are, there are four A4 or A5 sheets oh, on yes. there, and they have some of the comments from the workshop participants as well. So we're kind of linking art with the writers of the past, the comments of the present, and yes. then the, the, the art that kind of brings it together. So you you came to one of our supporters' events, and and you you, yes. you sort of you were in the gallery, weren't you, while we were open for a day or two? Yeah. Would you like to say something about responses? Yes, so um, I was stood there and I was, again, asking people to fill in my survey, you know, um, but I think some responses were really quite striking because I think um, people were surprised to see something that brings such a important issue and such a current issue into the museum environment. Um, so we had some really great feedback and the impact um, has been really incredible. Um, and I don't think it's, you know, blowing my own trumpet to say that the um, the project has been huge and the impact um, and what people have said about it has been really incredible. And just standing there, getting to hear people's thoughts, um, being able to talk to people about things. I really don't want to give too much away because that's for Rachel. But um, mm. yeah, the visitor response has been incredible. Um, people weren't used to seeing something like this. And I think that's really important. Well, you, you didn't know I was going to do this. Um, but oh, yeah. I, I, no, no, it's all right. <laughs> I, I, I've got some of those responses that people have entered onto the iPad in the gallery. And uh, the sort of things they've said is that the personal stories evoke a greater response, possibly because some of the women died so young. Recognizing disability is something we shy away from. I've never regarded poetry art in relation to people with disabilities. So these are these are the kind of you know su perhaps surprises or, or learning points for people um, and then the answer to the question what in particular did you learn um, how many people are affected in different ways by disabilities um, didn't realize how disability was more restrictive for women about the hardship suffered in centuries past with far less help available than current times and about Dorothy Wordsworth's illness so these are all kind of you know if you like perception changing moments perhaps for people um, when when they see this gallery, so well, I mean, well done you. Uh, you, you. You did so. You, you went on a venture. It's a successful venture. You've had good people to work with. I know we, we're going to meet them soon. But uh, congratulations to you, Harriet. Well, thank um, you. I think what we'll do, we'll we'll take a short break. Um, we'll maybe take a break for three or four minutes, and then when we come back, uh, you'll take the lead, and we'll hear more about the responses in detail. But but thank you for sharing the journey with us so far. Thank okay. you for having me. It's, a, it's great. So let's, let's, if we look at the time, if it, it's about eight o'clock. So in about five past eight, we'll, we'll reconvene and uh, see you soon. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you're all back from your break. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Rachel Sparks, who um, ran one of the workshops the theatrical one um, and also created this um, really striking piece of artwork so hi Rachel. Um, so Rachel is an actor and an artist who trained at East 15 acting school in London. She has performed in numerous high profile venues including the National Theatre, The Other Palace, while her film work has screened at the BFI IMAX and the Edinburgh Fringe. She is also a visual artist and launched her commission business Sparks Art during lockdown to great success. Alongside her creative pursuits, Rachel works with young people with a range of disabilities. So now I would just like to invite you to talk about your workshop. What happened? 
Yeah, so as you said, I've worked with young people with disabilities for quite a number of years now. So I wanted to bring some of what I've learned from that experience to helping people to understand what it's like to live with a disability um, and just get a, a kind of greater greater understanding of that. So, I mean, it's it's great to hear that it's had had that impact and, and particularly some of the things you've said about people understanding the range of disability. Um, for my workshop, the focus was on the impact of developing an impairment later in life, because that was something that all of our writers experienced. Um, therefore, the focus of my workshop was kind of simulating the experience of different physical disabilities through various exercises. For my workshop, it was non-disabled participants. Um, I then wanted to get the participants thoughts on how it felt to be unable to do some of the things that they usually take for granted and hopefully put them into the shoes of our authors a little bit. Um, it was challenging in some ways creating a theatre workshop for Zoom on the topic of physical impairment. Um, so I'll just take you through a few of, of the things we did. We looked at hearing impairment. Um, so I put on a white noise track that I got on YouTube, asked people to cover their ears. I then read a newspaper article uh, rapidly using a soft voice, mumbling monotone, running words together and pausing in odd places. I then asked the participants questions about the content of what I read um, and we discussed any frustration that they experienced about not being able to hear or being able to hear certain bits but not the whole message of what I was saying. Um, I also had a look at lip reading, um, which was an exercise about I would read a series of words, sort of um, ship, chimp, punk, short words with similar mouth sounds. Um, I would say those without any sound um, and got the participants to write down what they heard. I then did a series of sentences um in the same way I did them again but saying vaguely what theme um and we were kind of discussing the experience of what it's like to try and lip read um and getting their thoughts on that and we kind of discussed there's a there's a lot of guessing involved some people are better at lip reading than others it's um much more difficult with single words with similar mouth shapes and it helps to know the topic. Um, I also shared with them that actually over enunciating for instance doesn't help because most people who've learned to lip read have learned to lip read off fairly naturalistic speaking. Um, we also looked at physical impairment um, so I asked them to do a, a various things with one hand, um, try and kind of morning routine stuff like tying their shoes, um, brushing their teeth, opening a jar. Um, and again, just discussing the kind of problems they had with that. Um, and that relates particularly to Frances Burney, for instance, who, who talks about having very limited use of one of her arms. Um, also the experience of, of being in a wheelchair, uh, often you are reduced to using one hand. Um, we looked at blindness a little bit so I asked them to close their eyes and navigate the room um, I asked them to give us a little tour of their house with with their eyes closed uh, again we discussed the difficulties they had with that um, and also looked at visual impairment in the sense I, I took a chunk of text and altered the resolution to make it blurred um, and we discussed the frustration of maybe being able to make out some words the sort of sense of a word but not quite being able to get get the full meaning um and a lot of a lot of stuff came up for them and i had some really interesting conversations and very insightful comments from the participants um one of the participants talked about how she felt her brain very quickly adapting to the removal of a sense or um finding ways to compensate. So that was quite an interesting conversation. Um, we, we had a lot of discussion about frustration, um, which I think comes across quite strongly in some of the texts we're looking at. Um, we also, a big thing we talked about though was, was alternative 
ways of looking at disability and the development of disability and that it it doesn't need to be seen as negative as I think it often is in, in our society and doesn't need to be looked at as a loss but rather a, a difference that can be celebrated um, and that tied in quite nicely with some of the thoughts I'd had about the text so Great, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts um, and we'll re return to you to discuss the artwork shortly. Um, so now I would just like to introduce um, a couple of the participants from Rachel's workshop um, just to discuss um, their thoughts. So um, Clara Baudet is a French and Spanish doctoral student at Jesus College working under the supervision of Professor Katrina Seth. Um, Clara focuses on grand tourists and marginal figures in early romantic Naples, and she explores the creation and consumption of stereotypes on the local population. She is also working alongside the Compton Verney Art Gallery to deliver outreach events for local schools. Um, and then Nora Baker is a third year DPhil student in French literature at Jesus College. Um, her current research focuses on memoirs written by Huguenot refugees following the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685. She is also supervised by Catriona Seth. Um, welcome. Um, so I have some questions for you and maybe I can start with you, um, Clara. So what were your expect expectations for the workshop? What did you think was going to happen when um, you were invited? Um. I thought it was going to be much more descriptive um, and that we would be talked through the daily life of people with disabilities, uh, something much more descriptive and less engaging than what we actually had. So that was nice. Um, and what, what you said, um, Rachel, about the, the way your brain adapts when one of your senses is removed, I, I found really interesting and you made a very good job at um, and making us see that, yeah. Clara, if I could return to you, what did you think about the author's experiences? Uh, yeah. Um, what I found really interesting is the the struggle, and um, underneath, I think I think the struggle is really the the main thread that links all of the texts, and underneath the struggle, there's really this fighting spirit that you can really feel. Um, what I found interesting, for example, in Frances Bernie's letter is when she writes, um, for a month, I could not speak of this terrible business without nearly uh, again going through it. I could not think of it with impunity. Um, so we can really feel the, the trauma of the whole ordeal. Um, and she, she had to wait to be in a state where it was actually physically possible to write. And the fact that, it, that she has this almost masochistic way of reminiscing the whole process um, where physical pain and mental pain just blend together, I, I just found really interesting. Great, thank you. Um, Nora, can you try again? Uh, yeah, can you hear me now? Oh, yes, perfect. Okay. perfect. Thank you. Okay, that's good. <laughs> uh, yes, so if I can return to you, what were your expectations for the workshop? Um, yeah, I was just saying I wasn't really sure what to expect, I think, going into it. You know, I didn't really have like a clear idea of what exactly would happen. Um, but I think I was kind of I was really curious to see how it would work considering the digital format. You know, I was kind of wondering how that might shape the experience. Um, but uh, I think maybe I didn't expect it to be quite as like dynamic, you know, considering especially the fact that it was virtual uh, as dynamic as it was, because um, we really kind of um it was quite um is it somatic kind of a, the experience kind of experiencing um it with our bodies yeah great thank you and then I guess um do you think your perspective changed as a result of the workshop I think so yeah because it sort of just made me think about things that I hadn't really considered before I had the privilege not to have to consider them too much um, about you know, how long it takes me to do certain things. Um, I, I just, and, and you found appreciation of how many steps um, someone dealing with physical disabilities has to go through um, in order to, to um, uh, take on everyday tasks. So yeah, it was, it was really, really useful in that regard. Great, thank you. Um, and Clara, 
Um, has your perspective changed? Uh, I mean, it definitely raised my awareness. And um, I think it was when we were doing the exercises, you know, lip, lip reading, and I just couldn't make sense of it. I got um, I got irritated very quickly. So I think that's, I, I, I sort of, yeah, that really raised my awareness of like how annoying um, a disability actually is. Yeah. Okay. So overall then, um, I suppose this is a more philosophical question. Do you think that writing can mediate these powerful or difficult emotions in a sufficient way? I think that's a really interesting question because I sort of feel what I got from reading the the excerpts of the writing and what I got from actually participating in the workshop were sort of two different things and they complemented each other um sort of that uh, physical bodily experience and that reading experience you kind of imagine things differently to how you enact them out um so I guess you you might kind of encounter it in different ways but certainly writing in that way can kind of bring across um you know a kind of an appreciation of things and like how what it's like to be inside someone's mind and what um their life is actually like um in a totally different way because it can express emotions um so much and um i really felt like i got an insight into the emotional interior lives of these writers um by looking at the episodes thank you and clara do you have anything to add um yeah, well, I don't know if writing can convey difficult emotions in a, in a sufficient way, but um, turning to art, I, I feel, can definitely work as an outlet for emotions, and it might also become part of the healing process. And um, writing, I think, has cathartic powers. So I would say when it's something um, as visceral as suffering from a disability, writing definitely is a way of alleviating the pain um, and sharing it. Yeah. Great, thank you. And then my last question um, to both of you is that is, is there anything that you will do differently having experienced um, the workshop? I think um, it might help me to pay more attention to sort of how people write about um, lived experience um, and what it's like kind of in one's own head while go undergoing something that's difficult to do in terms of one's body and physical abilities and how that kind of interacts with the mental process. I think that's something that I'll definitely like reflect on more. Great, thank you. And Clara, do you have anything to add? Honestly, the same as, as Nora. Um, maybe if, if I can just add something is, um, I think it's quite interesting um, to, to have this perspective on romanticism because it really sheds an original uh, light, it really feeds in an original way in the theme of the, of the Mel du siècle, which is about, you know, melancholy, the disease of the soul, the suffering. So I thought it was an original angle to, um, to study romanticism, yeah. Great, thank you both so much for coming and sharing your insights. It was a, a real pleasure to work with you both. Um, so thank you. Um, and then, I will now move on to discussing my workshop um, with um, Bridget and Siobhan, um, who are here tonight. So my workshop um, was more of a literary workshop. We discussed the experiences of the participants um, and then we also looked at the texts as well. Um, so my workshop was uh, with participants with disabilities. Um, so it's really my great pleasure to welcome Bridget and um, Siobhan. So um, I will just give you there a brief introduction. So um, after many years working in administration for the NHS, Bridget left to follow a dream and fulfill her love of literature to study for a BA honors in English literature. To develop a deeper understanding of romanticism, she continued her studies with an MA in literature, romanticism and the English Lake District with the University of Cumbria. And then Siobhan um, retired as a university careers lecturer when she was just over 30, um, as her multiple sclerosis deteriorated. Since then, she has worked as a researcher and completed a postgraduate diploma in creative writing. She is an active disability rights campaigner and has kept writing for, for the last 20 years, 
She loves to write poetical pieces for special people. So welcome um, to both of you. So um, if I could direct this question at you first, Bridget, um, can you tell us a little bit more about you? Yes, well, hello, Harriet, and uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm really thrilled to take part in this. Um, well, it's a wonderful opportunity. It really is for me. Um, and I would just, um, I live in Northumberland. Um, I was uh, born with a congenital hemangioma, um, which is like a large varicose vein of the right hand and arm. So I always had a weakness, um, but I have always just tried to be, um, live an, as normal life as possible, even though it was you know, weaker than, uh, than my left hand. Um, and then in 2019, I had an accident and I broke my right humerus. And unfortunately, because of the bone structure, uh, it was impossible to mend. So I've spent the last two and a half years um, with an extra challenge and uh, just readdressing my my arm really and uh, it's still a learning curve even tonight being trying to be organized with paperwork and computers <laughs> it's a, it's a it, yeah it is a challenge so um yeah and i'm really enjoying my studies uh, i'm uh, coming to the end of my um ma i've got one assignment and then my dissertation over the summer so uh yeah i, I really like it Great, thank you. And thank you for sharing your experiences. Um, Siobhan, if I could ask you the same question, can you tell us a little bit more about you? Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Siobhan. Um, I want to tell you really the new, I've already told you through Harriet. Um, yeah, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis when I was 30 after a few years with problems. I'm now 54. No, I'm not 53. Um, and um, yeah, you can still have relapses. And uh, unfortunately, but luckily, um, my body's just gradually deteriorated in different places over the years. So now I can't move from the neck downwards. So in all my training sessions, it's always important to say to people, have a good look inside the person before you make any judgments. Because it's like when a person gets dementia when they're older, you know, you know who they really are. You know what they really like, what they really loved, what they can do. That's who's still in there. So that's who you're really with. Thank you. That's really, really um, a powerful statement. Thank you very much. Um, so I guess one of my main questions, um, and we kind of address this in the workshop is, how do the voices of women with disabilities from 200 years ago um, speak to you? Um, well, I felt that when I had my accident in 2019, um, and I was in my final undergraduate degree of you know, English, uh, I was actually doing a, um, a module on romanticism. And one of the poets obviously was Dorothy Wordsworth. And uh, she was really part of my um, healing. Uh, she was a tremendous influence, and especially um, the poem Thoughts from My Sick Bed, which um, I spent quite a lot of time in bed and going to A&E and &E, uh, things like that over the, the sort of first few months. And um, I, I felt that the, the poem um, Dorothy Words was, you know, from the sick bed, especially when she says, um, I 
I felt a power unfelt before, controlling weakness, languor, pain. It bore me to the terrace walk and I trod the hills again. And so it was in her memory, you know, that she was doing that walk. And uh, I really, really resonated with her particularly. I mean, the other poets are marvellous and I'll talk about those in the next questions, but it was really Dorothy, you know, for me that helped my initial, um, my initial extra challenge, so I call it. Thank you. Well, looking at what they wrote a couple of hundred years ago, it said more to me about how society has changed and how it's still changing. But for women in particular, they have to be able to rely on other people to look after them and to empower them so that their writing is released into the world and gives that insight to whether it be disability they want to write about or other things, because you can be inspired by memory you can be inspired by all sorts, but one way or another, you've still got a lot to say. Yeah, that's very powerful. And I think that was one of the things that I really, um, that really struck me when we did our workshop was um, the idea that, you know, for people like Susanna Blameyer, um, who haven't really been studied, um, the fact that we are able to discuss her experiences today is all the more powerful because you know she's she's alive again today and we're learning about her experiences um in the same breath as we're learning about people's experiences today um do you think society has changed enough in its um treatment or attitudes towards disability That was a very difficult question, I think, because um, I would I would err to the to the answer of no. Um, but then here we are tonight discussing disability and your project is so important. And you've obviously the exhibition at Words with Grasmere has um, filled people with such probably all really, um, seeing how disability was coped with 200 years ago and then coped with now, um, because it is still a challenge. You know, I find my own disability is, can be quite isolating um, and we need help. We still need help and support. Um, and of course it's, it's super because I have, you know, my family and, um, I know friends, but I, I don't know a society in a whole as a whole. Um, I don't know. There is more awareness, yes, but I, I, I do think that it is still a, a challenge that needs to be addressed. Yeah, thank you, Siobhan. Do you want to add your well, perspective? No, it hasn't changed enough. Um, in establishing what I did in our town. It was raising awareness, breeds understanding, which leads to action. And what you hope is that people will come out of each session thinking, God, I've never looked at it like that. Mm -hmm. Or you know, I've never seen it from that angle. Oh, I'd never thought of that. And it's so simple. Mm -hmm. And you can do the training online. But either way, it's just some, it's like language is so yes. simple. And yet people don't think about the words they're using. It's out their mouth before they've realized it. Yeah. And so the most important thing I say to them is just, stop and think about your audience before you speak yeah no exactly because 
Yeah, sorry. I, I that just reminds me of um, a moment when we were discussing um, Mary Robinson's um, disability, and actually, I made the same mistake. And this is one of the things that has really impacted me. Was I think I said Mary Robinson ended up in a wheelchair, and you immediately stopped me. You stopped me. Um, and you just explained to me, and I think this is what I really want other people to have the same experiences as, as I did. And you stopped me and you said, no, 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 Harriet, no. She became a wheelchair user. And like you said, it had come out of my mouth and I'm ashamed now because I didn't even think about it, but it was the fact that you made me realize that such a, such a what I thought was just a, a turn of phrase you know, is so important and language is so important. Um, so if we, if we can get that message across in, in the exhibition, then, you know, that's one of the things that's really powerful. Yeah, it's a starting point. Yeah. And uh, so you move on to language and through all sorts of games you can play and people suddenly get an insight and it's not their fault you know 30 years ago when it when i was your age <laughs> i thought i understood and i didn't i didn't i just wasn't aware of it at all at all and then if you layer that on top of i mean i've got a copy of about Virginia Woolf and she wrote A Room of One's Own mm -hmm. and it was because she was a woman writer so her stuff and um, for most women getting to write in a place where it's peaceful enough to be on your own and have that space to write in her time was almost impossible for most women. And that's why a lack, there is a lack of women writers. And that's a really interesting perspective. And I guess from that, what I would like to ask you is, what can we learn from these women who continue to be creative um, whilst experiencing these challenges, these physical challenges and the, the changes because they had all of these things to overcome, but they were still writing, they were still having, they were still putting their voice out there. What can we learn from them? Yes, well, I think we can learn just a small word and it's hope. Um, and, it, and I know Siobhan talking about writing, but I'm a great reader as well. And I, I love to reflect on the reading and all of the poetry and I, emailed you you know today or yesterday and said that I was delving into the the four women writers that we've been studying in the last month and I've gained so much strength from their own challenges and the way that they have been able to you know just be creative and to write and it's uh, so it's instilled in me you know that the passion so if anything we can bring that forward you know bring the past to today and uh, and just feel enriched you know by the gifts that they have given us and um and go forward from there and hopefully you know everyone who's listening you know can go away and look up those women writers and 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 see what i what i'm uh, what i mean because uh, um, they really are Wonderful. And of course, there are lots of other writers as well hidden away. Um, I'm sure that you'll uh, help me with them, Harriet, you know, to find them. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but, um, I just, you know, it's just wonderful. But I would say, you know, it's just hope. That's what I have got from, from this experience anyway. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's, I, I keep using this word powerful because it really is everything that we learn about um, the experiences of people with disabilities every time we discuss this. I think it, we are doing something important, like you said. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And Siobhan, um, I'll return to you with the same question. 
Um, what can we learn from these women? Well, I think for women throughout the ages, like anyone who's been disempowered in society and forced to live on the edges of it unless they could find their own way, um, then it's, it's been inside of them. They will get it out. They will write it down whichever which way they can. It's just that they don't have the same means of getting it into the public eye unless they are powerful enough to come together and campaign. That it should be so. Yeah. You know, you've seen that with the Me Too campaign. You've seen it with women getting equal pay in society. Mm -hmm. Unless they come together, unless they listen to each other and they join with each other, then they, they can't do anything if you're left isolated and on your own. Yeah. I think that's an important message. Um, one of the important messages to um, get across to our audience tonight. Um, but I suppose if I had to pick one thing that you would like our listeners to, um, or watchers, to take away from this webinar, what, what, what message would you like them to take away from this? If it is in you to want to write, and I know I've written since I was a young child, then you need to write whatever. So whatever condition you are in, ability-wise, or the people who are more powerful than you in society, more engineeringly focused, have the capacity to help you write, to help you get that on paper for others to read. And like Bridget says, get hope from. So that's, that's what's brilliant about our modern society. The, you know, I use the computer by using eye gaze technology and that's provided by the NHS. Otherwise I wouldn't do anything except watch daytime TV. Yeah. Wow. I, that is incredible that you're able to use this technology and it's how we've managed to, um, you know, have this experience and we've done our workshops um, and it's how you've been able to be a part of it. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you for sharing all of your insights. Um, it's really, really been incredible. Um, and it's been, from my perspective, it's been incredible to learn from you. Um, so thank you. And then I will just return to Bridget and ask you the same question. What message would you like to get across tonight? Well, just really from what um, Siobhan said, um, I think being creative is invaluable. And if you do have a dream like I had, you know, go for it as, as best as you can. It might not turn out the way that you want, but even if you have a five-year plan, you can change it. So, you know, just just do your best and just go for it. I'm actually, I'll have to listen to myself while I'm saying that. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've been, you know, thinking about writing myself. I, I'm not very good at uh, writing, but uh, I do like reading, as I said. But yes, just follow follow that thought and that pattern of thought yeah thank you so much 
Yes, and thank you both for being a part of this. It, as I said at the very start, it's been a journey for me. I hope it's been a journey for our listeners and a journey for everybody involved, because I think it, that's how we learn. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Harriet. Okay. So now um, I would like to invite Rachel back to talk through her marvellous artwork. Um, and I will now share my screen again um, to show you some images of this. So um, over to you, Rachel. Yeah, so I think one of the things I got from reading the extracts um, was a kind of a sense of loss and a sense of frustration. Um, these writers share the experience of developing a disability slightly later in life. Um, and I guess these extracts reflect some of their coming to terms with these losses. Um, as an artist myself, I was affected by that sense of grief and frustration in some of these extracts. And I wanted to explore that creatively. Um, I also wanted to examine the idea of difference of ability as opposed to disability um, and explore the idea that disability can bring with it alternative extraordinary talents um, and lead to powerful art in its own right. Um, and I think that comes across in, in some of the conversations we've had tonight about literature and creativity um, and, and, and resilience as well. Um, and I think what, what struck me is how each of these women has channeled their experiences into beautiful writing. Um, so I wanted to, to look at that idea of, of how much beauty is springing from something that society has labeled impairment. Um, the floating letters are symbolic of women finding poetry as a way to express themselves, express these frustrations. Um, and they, the letters kind of, I felt tied together the four separate pieces as a whole and tied together the overarching themes of the exhibition. Um, the liar piece, which is what's on screen at the moment, is a creative interpretation of the liar the speaker can no longer play in Susanna Blameye's poem. Um, for me, the breaking of the liar was a powerful symbol of the sense of loss that came through in this poem. Um, Blameyer speaks of <clears throat> a kind of painful irony of not being able to play the liar while its song would so beautifully express the way she feels. Um, and thrilling yet along the line, would aid this falling note of mine, then melting with a plaintive air seemed a weak sort of echo there. Um, this seemed to me to really speak of a frustration she was feeling as an artist needing to express herself without access to the previous method she did so. Um, the broken strings of the lyre became a metaphor perhaps for the way these women felt about themselves in their new bodies, um, no longer able to do some of the things they took for granted. Um, and again, that's just talking about this way uh, that they found literature to express themselves, um, uh, which is particularly prominent in some someone like Mary Robinson, who'd formerly been an actress, who, who could no longer do that. Um, but in all four of the writings, they were far from obsolete. Um, and, and you see that in the way that we're still reading them and people are still finding them beneficial uh, and learning from their experience. Um, the lyre is an ancient symbol of music and poetry um, and Blameyer is using it as an expression of loss, but there is a huge, healing power in poetry so the use of the lyre in, ex in the exhibition is, is kind of about that um, and Blamar is making a plea to Hygieia the goddess of health and in a way perhaps the art of poetry is Hygieia's answer to that plea. Um, then the next slide is the footsteps piece. Um, the footsteps were inspired by Dorothy Wordsworth's love of walking which was curtailed by the onset of her disability. Um, 
I've used wool as a symbol of femininity as spinning was a craft dominated by women in a domestic setting in this period. Uh, William Wordsworth was very troubled by the silence of the spinning wheels brought about by mechanization um, and the introduction of large scale mills, which he mentions in a number of his poems, um, such as Grief Thou Hast Lost an Ever Ready Friend, in which he compares the spinning wheel to the harp or lute, which ties quite interestingly with the lyre piece. Um, he also refers to the spinning wheel as she. Um, wool carries with it connotations of, of newfound female obsolescence in this period, particularly in this area, which has a long history of wool production. Um, so as with the lyre, I'm exploring the way our writers may have felt that they've been rendered obsolete by the onset of their disability. Um, the map underneath the wall is an antique map of the Lake District, which is symbolic both of the landscape Dorothy loved to ramble in um, and an area that was particularly bereft with the mechanization of wall production. Um, also, just in a, in a visual sense, I liked the way that the dropping wall kind of gave the asset effect that the, the footsteps are melting away and into the environment. Um, the next pieces are the wheels. Um, in these, I'm using ideas around found objects, which is an artistic movement popularized by Marcel Duchamp. Uh, the function is to dignify everyday objects, objects to the level of art and to celebrate our relationship with these objects. Um, I liked the symbolism of found objects in relation to mobility aids um, and, and this idea of, of bringing dignity to them as they provide independence and, and dignity to a user and, and help them. It's the kind of technology to, to help them have their independence. Um, found objects derive their identity as art from the designation placed on them by the artist and the social history that comes with the object. And this can be indicated by it's an on, on an, uh, anonymous wear and tear. Um, I used pre-used wheelchair wheels, which were broken and muddy and still held the shadow of their previous user, which I thought rendered them all the more beautiful and kind of symbolized the, the life they've had, helping someone with their disability. Um, the use of wheels obviously ties in quite nicely with the wool spinning theme and symbolism. Um, the idea of the spider's web in one of the pieces was also in reference to spinning um, and spiders, but also looking at beauty in nature and beauty in the everyday. Um, and even the idea of finding beauty in something that society has given a, a negative label as with spiders, uh, spiders webs, um, the story of Arachne, all that kind of thing. Um, the embellishment of the wheels and the letters reflect some of these ideas about beauty and disability and beauty coming from uh, work that discusses and expresses the experience of people with disabilities, which we talked about in the workshops. Um, I also included sunflowers, which was something that came up in, in the workshops that participants felt it, it was important to uh, acknowledge hidden disability as well um, and the sunflower is a symbol of that so it's a very quick run through of, of some of my thoughts going on there. Thank you, thank you for um, explaining all of the different elements um, and I hope you can see that each of the elements helps to bring out a larger story um, and the larger idea that um, this is something we should be talking about and this is something that belongs in a museum environment and we should be talking about this. Um, so thank you, Rachel, for that um, really brilliant explanation of your thought process. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers um, who have discussed their experiences too. Um, so I think if I hand back over to Jeff at this point, um, that would be great. Thank you, Harry. Well, don't you go away. 
Um, no, 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 I'm not going anywhere. That's good. Um, that, that's, that's left a real impression. Um, I, I'm kind of um, taken by the, the openness with which people have talked tonight, um, with, with Clara and Nora particularly talking about their learning. I've, I've really enjoyed hearing the Rachel's dis discussing the artwork um, because of the, it just brings extra meaning to it. And uh, as one of our visitors said, didn't they? It's really worth seeing in person. And that, that it, it is, it's very striking. It's, it's uh, certainly, there's nothing else like it in the museum. Um, I was struck, I guess, particularly by the words of, of Siobhan and, and of Bridget and how they, they talk so openly about their experiences. And I was, when Siobhan said one way or another, you still got a lot to say, you need to write. I mean, these are words that are gonna resonate. And I guess if we're thinking about the inspiration, which was the starting point of the, of the women from the past, they have inspired people to write as a from the from these workshops. And then, wasn't it that the, the Bridget said, "Hope is what I've got from these experiences." Well, isn't that a great purpose of literature and art too, to, to kind of give us hope and to uh, and, and and that has come through as well. What did also Bridget say, didn't she? Uh, where she said that the starting point is is a changing of perception and uh, a change of language, and that this can lead to action and Again, inspired by the four women from the past and from the workshops and from the art, then hopefully our visitors will, will, will do that. We, we've got one particular piece of feedback on the pegboard, haven't we, that we, we thought we might like to share. Have you got a picture of that? Yes, I will just um, reshare my screen. There we are. So in, in the museum next to the exhibition, uh, we invite comments um, from visitors. And this one was particularly striking. We, we almost set this as a, as a target for ourselves, didn't we? That if the exhibition was to have impact, we'd, we'd expect or hope for comments on the pegboard. And it says here, if, you, if, you, if you're struggling to read that, thank you for the disability exhibit. As a woman with an invisible disability, I have never felt so seen. And that is, is a, a, well, it, it, it comes with feeling that. It's a, it's a very, as we ever, we ever use this, don't we? But it's a very kind of emotional thing to see there. Um, I would also, uh, just before we, we sort of, before we finish, um, there was another uh, comment from one of the workshop attendants, Harriet, which you, you sent us through a few to look at. And um, I'll just read this if I may. Um, this is from one of the workshop attendants. Often I don't really want to talk about it, but then it's a personal thing, isn't it? I mean, personal, as in some people will be all right talking about it. Here I am in this workshop, and this is the first time talking about me, and I'm not with a medical person that I've ever talked about anything like this. I think, you know, that's part of my journey. It's gonna stick with me. And you might say, well, the four women of the past might be very pleased to know that their writing 200 years later is starting other people on journeys, maybe with some kind of shared experience. Um, I think this is your first webinar, isn't it, that you've led? Yes. You're a canny natural, if I may say so. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> put the plan together, uh, you've delivered it, and you did it, if I may say, brilliantly. And I'm sure everybody who's with us would agree with me. Um, congratulations. There. Thank you very much. Oh, well done. Um, I, I, I got a lot from that, a great deal from that. Um, just looking ahead a little, um, we have an event um, in June, on June the 8th, which is called Ridiculous Romantics, um, or is the Romantic Ridiculous. And this is um, Dr. Andrew McInnes and Dr. Rita Bashwood from Edge Hill University. And it's exploring the, the plain absurdities uh, in romanticism, the things that we all take super seriously. Um, but they, they can kind of see a, a, a ridiculous side to it or a funny side to it. And uh, so on the 8th of January, there will be serious romanticism and then sort of slightly absurd takes on it. And uh, I found once, once, you, once the absurd is pointed out to you, things like uh, Wordsworth's episode of the stolen boat on Ullswater, you can never look at again in the same light. So please do join us on July, uh, June the 8th. Um, a final word just to thank Hannah, as always, for making these events possible. And a great thank you to everybody who's joined us this evening. Um, thank you very much. Um, we'll keep the, the webinar running just a little bit. 
and please do add your comments. It's really good to see some comments coming through, but please do, uh, if you have a moment of reflection, just add to it and uh, we'd be wonderful to see um, what, what your response, what, what impact it's had on you. So thank you again, Harriet. Thank you everyone for being with us and we'll say good night. We'll turn our cameras off and uh, hope to see you on June the 8th, if not before. Thank you. Yes, thank you everybody. Oh, thank you, thank you very much.